Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian Y, and this is Managerial Economics. In this video, we're going to combine what we know about consumer preferences and budgets to find the consumer equilibrium. We will then show how consumer choice leads to demand functions. The consumer's problem is a consumer's choice of which bundle to consume given their preferences and budget. The idea of the consumer's problem is to select the highest utility bundle among the feasible bundles in their budget set. The chosen bundle is called the equilibrium choice. The consumer cannot improve their utility by switching to any other bundle unless their budget changes. There are two criteria that must be satisfied for the equilibrium bundle. First, the marginal rate of substitution of x for y must equal the ratio of px to py. That's the price of x divided by the price of y. If we substitute in the definition of the MRS, which is the marginal utility of x divided by the marginal utility of y, that must equal the price ratio. I mentioned previously that we could also do this entire problem by flipping all of the x's and y's, and you can definitely do that if you want, but I'm going to stay consistent by keeping the marginal utility and price of x in the numerator and marginal utility and price of y in the denominator. But if you want to flip them, you can definitely do that and get the exact same answer. We can do a little algebra here to come to an alternative interpretation of this equation. I'm going to multiply both sides by py, which is going to cancel out this py, and then I'm going to multiply both sides by the marginal utility of y, which is going to cancel this out. We now have marginal utility of x times py equals marginal utility of y times px. I'm now going to divide both sides by px, which is going to cancel this out, and then I'm going to divide both sides by py, which is going to cancel this out. This leaves me with marginal utility of x divided by px equals marginal utility of y divided by py. You can think of this as the marginal utility per dollar for each good need to be equal. If they're not equal, this tells us we can do more with our money and achieve a higher level of satisfaction. The second criterion for the equilibrium bundle is that the consumer needs to spend all of their money. So px times x plus py times y must equal m. Unspent income does not provide any utility to the consumer. So if the marginal rate of substitution equals the price ratio and the chosen bundle is on the budget line, we know we have found the equilibrium choice. Let's do the graphical interpretation of this. I'm going to sketch a graph here with good x and good y. Then I'm going to sketch in our budget line. Remember that the goal of the consumer's problem is to figure out which of the points inside of the triangle here is the best one. Since we know that more is better, selecting a bundle that is within the triangle could never be the equilibrium choice. The equilibrium bundle must be on the budget line somewhere. The question is which one to pick. We want to find the one that gives us the highest utility. If I were to draw in an arbitrary indifference curve like this, remember that all of the points along this indifference curve give our consumer the same level of utility. There are two that are on the budget line, this one and this one. Could either of those be the equilibrium choice? Based on what we know about utility, all of the bundles in the area up and to the right of our indifference curve here would be preferred. And many of those are still contained within the budget set. All of these bundles in this banana shape here are both affordable and also preferred to the points along the blue indifference curve. So we can do better. Taking this to the logical conclusion, we then will push our indifference curve out until it gets to the point where that banana shape is gone. The indifference curve corresponding with the equilibrium bundle must be the one that is tangent to the budget line. How do we know this is the equilibrium choice? Well, all of the bundles that are better than that bundle are not affordable. They are outside of the budget set triangle. So this bundle at which there is an indifference curve tangent to the budget line must be the one. Remember that we mentioned earlier that the slope of an indifference curve at any given point is the absolute value of the marginal rate of substitution. 
of x for y, and the slope of the budget line is the absolute value of the price ratio. And if those things are going to be tangent, they need to be equal, which is precisely our first condition for finding the equilibrium. This point is also on our red budget line, which means that we also have to have our second equation satisfied. What we just done on the graph is exactly equivalent to what we just talked about using the equations. Let's take our example utility function from the preferences video, u of x, y equals x to the one third, y to the two thirds, and then take our example budget line from the budgets video, 4x plus 5y equals 60. Remember that we got this from the price of x is 4, the price of y is 5, and the total income is 60. This is all the information that we're going to need to figure out the consumer equilibrium. Let's set up the two equations that we needed. Remember that the marginal rate of substitution of x for y is the marginal utility of x divided by the marginal utility of y. In our preferences video, we showed that the marginal utilities are 1 third x to the negative 2 thirds y to the positive 2 thirds for x, and for y we had 2 thirds x to the 1 third y to the negative 1 third. We also did a little bit of work to simplify this down to y over 2x. If you want to see the detailed steps, then you should go back to the preferences video to see how I did that. Our first equation is going to be MRS equals the price ratio. So we're going to have y over 2x equals px over py, which is 4 over 5. And for our second equation, we have the budget line. 4x plus 5y equals 60. We now have a system of equations with two unknowns and two equations, so we're going to be able to solve. You can go about this however you want, but what I'm going to do is start with equation 1 and solve it for y. So I'll write this out, y over 2x equals 4 over 5. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2x, and that's going to give me y equals 2x times 4 over 5, which is going to be 8x over 5. I can now use substitution to plug in 8x equals 5 wherever we see y in equation number 2. So I'm going to get 4x plus 5 times 8x over 5, so there was a y there, I just replaced that with 8x over 5 since we know they're equal, equals 60. These 5's are going to cancel, and then that's going to leave me with 4x plus 8x equals 60. Combine these to get 12x equals 60, and then divide both sides by 12. That's going to give me x equals 60 over 12, which is 5. Next we need to solve for y. So recall that we already solved that y equals 8x over 5. So I'm just going to plug in the 5 for x. The 5's are going to cancel, and that's going to just give me y equals 8. Let's plug this into our utility function to see how much utility we end up with. So we're going to do u of 5 and 8, which is 5 to the 1 third times 8 to the 2 thirds. That comes out to about 6.84. So what does that mean to get 6.84 utility? Well, by itself, it means absolutely nothing. Remember that the actual utility number allows us to compare this outcome with other bundles. Any bundle that gives us more than 6.84 utility, we would prefer to this one, but we can't get those because of our budget constraint. And any bundle that gives us less utility than this would be not preferred. If conditions change and allow our consumer to afford a bundle that gives them more utility than this, then they would go for that and they would be happier for it. If conditions change that force them to accept a bundle that gives them less utility, then we would say that they are worse off than before. We'll now sketch a quick graph of this outcome. First I'm going to draw my budget line, which as we know from the previous video had intercepts of 15 and 12. We know the bundle they ended up picking 
is five and eight, somewhere about here. Okay, so this is gonna be our equilibrium. Now we wanna draw in the indifference curve that's tangent at that point. It's gonna look something like this. Now this is the indifference curve that corresponds with a utility of about 6.84. This is what your graph of the consumer equilibrium should roughly look like. You don't have to get the indifference curve exactly perfect, but you do want it to be tangent at the equilibrium point and also follow those general properties that we talked about for indifference curves. Again, notice that my indifference curve did not curl backwards. We don't want that. We have to have that nice shape that in math we call a hyperbola. The next thing we're going to do is show the connection between the consumer's problem, which we just did, and the demand function, which we've worked with before. Remember that when we worked with demand functions, we wrote them out something like this, qxd of a bunch of different variables, such as px, the price of itself, but also the price of other goods, income, and potentially other things. Notice we've been working with all these things when figuring out consumer choice. In the previous example, I specified values for each of those three, px, py, and m. But now we are going to figure out the demand function by leaving those variables as variables instead of specifying a specific amount. And that's going to be able to give us a demand function, which we can then later on plug in values and get the quantity demanded very, very easily. The way we're going to do this is just write out our budget line as PXX plus PYY equals M. We're not going to plug in any prices and income yet. We will then just go about the standard consumer problem where we have the marginal rate of substitution of X for Y equals PX over PY. Remember that our marginal rate of substitution in our example was Y over 2X, but it doesn't have to be. If the utility function is different, that is going to be different. That's going to be equal to PX over PY. And then we're going to take this equation and this equation and solve them as a system of equations, just like we did before. But again, we are leaving PX, PY, and M in there instead of plugging in numbers. I'm going to go about this basically the exact same way I did before. I'm going to take equation one and I'm going to solve it for Y. So I'm going to multiply both sides by 2X. That's going to give me y equals 2x px over py. I'm going to take this whole expression and I'm going to plug it in where I have a y there, exactly how we did this before. So pxx plus py times this whole thing, 2x px over py equals m. The pys are going to cancel. The PYs are going to cancel out. Notice that I now have PX times X and then 2X times PX. Since the order of multiplication doesn't matter, this PX times X is the same as this X times PX. So there's one of them here, two of them here. We're going to get 3PXX equals M. Divide both sides by 3PX and that's going to give me X equals M over 3PX. This tells me how much of good X our consumer is going to consume for any possible M and any possible PX. All I need to do is plug them in. This should sound familiar. This is the demand function for good X. If you want, you can rewrite this as QXD. I'm now going to plug this expression back into this equation right here where I have an X, I'm just going to plug in M over 3PX. That's going to give us Y equals 2. Now we're going to plug in for X, M over 3PX times PX over PY. These PXs are going to cancel. Now cleaning this up a little bit, we get Y equals 2M on top and then on bottom we have 3PY. This is again an equation for the amount of Y based on the income and the price. So this is our demand function for Y. You can see that to get the demand function, all we need to know is the utility function. We then set up the budget line and do 
the consumer's problem, and that's going to lead us right to the demand functions. Now these demand functions do look a little bit different from the ones that we worked with before. They're not linear. So these demand functions are not going to be straight lines, but they're going to be curves. Specifically, they are going to be hyperbolas, just like the indifference curves. If I were to graph one of these, just remember that x is m over 3px. The graph is only two dimensions, so I'm going to need to plug in an m. Let's just use our example m equals 60. This is going to give us 60 over 3px, which is going to be 20 over px. If I label my graph with quantity of x and price of x, the demand curve is going to look something like this. This demand curve still follows the law of demand. The higher the price, the lower the quantity. It's just not a straight line anymore. One really nice thing about these demand curves that arise from the Cobb-Douglas utility function is that they add up really, really nicely if we want to figure out what's the demand curve for an entire market. Remember that what we just did is the demand curve for just a single consumer, but a market consists of many consumers. Let's suppose that in addition to this consumer right here with who had an income of 60, we also had a consumer with an income of double that, of 120. Before we do that, let's make this our nice QXD. For our second consumer, we'll write QXD equals 120. They have that higher income divided by 3px. That's going to come out to 40 over px. If the market consists of these two consumers together, we can then add them up to get the market demand of 20 over px plus 40 over px, which is 60 over px. If you had more consumers, you just keep adding them on. We could do this a thousand times or a million times or however many consumers we have. Each time we do that, it's going to add to our demand curve, shifting it to the right. That covers the consumer choice problem. In the next video, we will use the techniques we've just learned to do an application to the principal agent problem.